Everything I'm going to tell you is at that website and at a couple of others. Have any of you seen me talk before? Well, I'm going to use the same jokes anyway. <laughs> That's our uh, current website. It has, oh, about 500,000 stories on food safety in the database, if you want to go find anything. That's all going to get changed in about a week, and it's going to look like this. My iPod's playing. So if you want any of this information, it's all free. It goes out to the world. You can get it anywhere. About once a week, we produce an info sheet like this. Dr. Phoebus even printed up the latest one. There you go. We used to hang them up, but that eh, takes people, and you know, you can get them all online. People are starting to take their, their you know, computers and their iPod touches to the bathroom, so we don't have to actually hang them on the back urinal stall. There, we used to hang these above urinals. That's how it started, because that's like a 20-second learning opportunity. What? <laughs> See, E. coli 0157 linked to the Western Stock Show in Denver. Anyone go to that? Oh, I thought there might be some. Yeah. 30 kids got sick. What do you think it was from? Not washing their hands? Yeah, well. It actually isn't quite that simple as just wash your hands. You know, there was an outbreak at a petting zoo probably about 2002, and they actually showed that the people who washed their hands and didn't wash their hands had the same incidence of 0157. And what they found out was that the 0157 was actually aerosolized in the manure dust in the pen. It was in the air. So it didn't matter if you washed your hands or not. And a whole bunch of people got sick. Which raises a question. Should there be petting zoos and open access to these animals? Why? Make your case. I'm the lawyer who's defending the sick kid, and I'm going to sue you for $2 million. Make your case. <laughs> I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just saying, when you leave here, these are the realistic questions you're going to be faced with. Should you have petting zoos where, you know, okay, where does 0157 come from? It's not just cows. It's all ruminants. Goats, sheep, deer, and I can show you outbreaks with all of them. You would go where? Okay, but let's say you're the manager of the petting zoo and you're going to get sued for millions of dollars by my friend Bill Marler, the lawyer. Okay, but that's not going to hold up in court. <laughs> and it hasn't, and that's why petting zoos get sued every year. Yes, ma'am, you were up first. question is, so why isn't that, you know, the people who own the cows don't get sick? Well, that's because if they were vulnerable, they died. And they're not around anymore. <laughs> you basically have, and there was a study done in Canada about 10 years ago on dairy farms, and it showed that the kids of dairy farmers, about half of them had antibodies, which means they'd been exposed to 0157. Now they did a case control with a bunch of city kids and they found that less than 5% had been exposed. Can you see any potential problems with this? Yeah. The kids who were immune from the farm, they've been exposed, are then going to daycare with city kids and passing the bug on to kids who do not have the immunity. Furthermore, this is the whole hygiene hypothesis, what you're talking about, that you know, if we're just exposed to a little bit of poop, we'll be healthier, and there is some truth to that. But, <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> but
But microbiologically speaking, Dr. Phoebus is very smart. I'm okay. <laughs> We're not nearly smart enough to figure out what bugs are going to affect what people. So what you're basically saying to politicians is, look, all this money that you're investing in on-farm food safety and eliminating 0157 from the food system, we, we'd be better off spending that on better schools and making sure there's paper towels where people can dry their hands in the bathroom. Now, we're going to lose a few along the way, and we don't know what few, but overall we'll be better. You show me a politician that wants to make that trade-off today. Because even in the good old days, you lost a few. And you don't know who that was. My mother, when she was four years old, in 1946, came down with undulate fever and almost died. And that was from drinking raw milk from grandpa's cows. And grandpa got rid of all the cows the next day and grew asparagus ever since. And he became a multimillionaire. This is whatever. <laughs> The point is, in the good old days, you lost a few. We don't know which few we're going to lose, and the United States is an affluent society. And we say, one is too many. Can you imagine going to the parent of some, who lost a kid from, at a petting zoo and saying, sorry, I guess your kid's immune system wasn't up to snuff? <laughs> yes, ma'am. The question is, can we just put, can we avoid legal liability by putting disclaimers out, such as pet at your own risk? Or if you look at menus in, uh, say, Washington State or a bunch of states, it says consuming uncooked uh, seafood and poultry is dangerous to your health. Does that protect the restaurant from legal liability if someone gets sick? No. You can put the warning signs out, but from a legal liability standpoint, you make someone sick, you're going down. And that's not sufficient. Especially if you knew, because basically by putting the signs out, you're saying, yeah, I know there's risks. So I didn't intend to come here and talk about law, but when you leave here, these are the questions that you're going to be faced with and, and that fair operators are faced with, and they're fair questions. Fair, fair. <laughs> Anyway, so it's not just a matter of, you know, these dumb city folk don't have the immunity that they need to have. People get very sick. If you're interested in these things, we write a blog called Barf Blog. What happens when people get foodborne illness? They barf. Have any of you had foodborne illness? It's okay. I, I, I think my mother tried to kill me through foodborne illness when I was young. Because <laughs> about twice a year, I'd spend the day on the couch watching The Price is Right or something because I was barfing all day. And I was in the 70s. And she didn't know any better. And in retrospect, most of that was probably food or waterborne illness through things like cross-contamination. So, how many of you have had foodborne illness? How do you know? Dr. Phoebus, did you get it <laughs> molecular typed? <laughs> no, but I knew the system so well. <laughs> I know. Okay. What do you, th you know, for those of you who have had it, do you think it was the last food you ate? Uh, that's actually wrong. It usually isn't. There are some viruses that are very quick, but for the most part, today's foodborne illness. Salmonella, E. coli, the things you read about, it's two to three days. Can you remember what you had for breakfast two days ago? That's because you eat the same thing every day, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, when you get older, you make it more creative with your dining choices, and it's harder to remember. Anyway, the numbers of sick people, how many people get sick in the United States each year from the food and water they consume? 76 million, that's very good. That number is 10 years old and is set to be revised. 
Basically, the World Health Organization says up to 30% of all people in every country get sick every year. So the world population is 6 billion, and they now say it's 2 billion people a year. Doesn't matter whether it's a developed country, an undeveloped country, 30% get sick. That's a ridiculously high number. And most of us ride it out. We sit on the toilet for a day, we might barf a lot, but not everyone does. And those numbers are not going down in the last four years. They're stagnant. So what that tells me is we need to do something different about how we talk about these things. And if people get upset about mentioning barf and things, well, too bad. Because that's actually what happens. I don't understand your question. You say, does it have, it has to do with what they're eating themselves? Yeah. What do you mean? You mean they're, they're eating food that, they're choosing to, they're choosing to eat food that makes them barf? Are you saying that healthy food will not make you barf? Wow, that's wrong. <laughs> that's really wrong. That's the point of this lecture. <laughs> we'll get to that. But it has nothing to do with eating at, you know, poor restaurants versus high quality restaurants. Turn your damn cell phone off. Or it doesn't have to do with uh, healthy food or unhealthy food. Any food can be made microbiologically unsafe. Quality is a different issue. What we're talking about is microbiologically safe. We also have poop shirts. <laughs> what makes you sick? This came out of spinach in 2006. E. coli 0157, four people died and 200 got sick. Why did they get sick and die? Pardon? They were eating cow poop. You've seen this stuff before. <laughs> they were eating cow poop. And I was explaining to a reporter about 0157 and how it transmits from cattle into spinach fields and actually gets taken up by the spinach so you can't wash it off. And I sort of lost her and I said, well, they're eating cow poop. And she said, yeah, I got a kid in daycare and they tell the kids, wash your hands, you don't want to eat poop. I said, that's right. First rule of public health, don't eat poop. So now we made shirts. Someone said, you should get that URL. And they're in French, Chinese, Spanish, and English. <laughs> and why are they in those languages? Because those are the languages of food service in the United States. The back kitchens. The people who last touched the food that you're going to eat are the ones you've got to get at. Right now, we're in a bit of a food safety mess, if you follow the news. And there's been outbreaks. Uh, this Peanut Corporation of America, you heard of that? They produce peanut paste stuff that was used in almost 4,000 products that have now been recalled. There are still recalls going on today. I find it baffling that major corporations like Kellogg's had no clue they were using this stuff until two months after the initial recall. That tells me their traceability isn't very good. How do companies when rely on food safety? Do they rely on government? I guess she didn't like my answers. <laughs> do, do companies rely on government? No. They rely on what are called third-party auditors to go in and check them out. You may have heard of one of these companies. It's called the American Institute of Baking. It's located just up here. They were the third-party auditor for Peanut Corporation of America. They said, this plant is excellent. Now, they were paid by the Peanut Corporation of America to produce that report. And Kellogg's took that report and said, we accept this blindly, thank you. 
Other companies like Nestle said, mm, we don't, we're not going to rely on your reports. We're going to use our own people and send our own people out, which they did a few years ago. They sent their own people to the Peanut Corporation of America plant. And based on their, the report of their own people, they said, we will not buy from you. The lesson here is, do not rely on third-party auditors. Use your own people. Because at the end of the day, your name is on that product. If your name is Kellogg's or Kraft or Nestle or whoever, and you're who's going to get sued if someone gets sick. So it's just like the financial stuff. It's a Ponzi scheme of auditing and everyone saying everything's OK. And it's sort of collapsed. So it's an interesting time to be in food safety. We've also had 15 years, and it's mildly ironic that today is Earth Day and I'm here talking to you, because as young tweens, you have been overexposed to everything Earth good, right? You all wear green things, you have green clothing, you ride, drive green cars, I don't know what you do. It's just ridiculous. You know, that all happened back in the late 80s, early 90s. It's, you didn't invent it. it ha and it actually happened in the 70s, too, and even before that. What we've got with food safety is 15 years of people marketing and doing nothing but hucksterism, just like at the turn of the century with medicine men. Go to the grocery store. Go to the grocery store and see how food is sold. It's all got pretty little labels and pictures of farms that don't exist. And it says it's natural. What does natural mean? Actually, there's no definition. Anyone can say anything is natural. What does organic mean? Dr. Phoebus and I are apparently going to be at the union on Monday night talking about what organic means. I didn't even know till I got the email. <laughs> uh, and I expect there'll be a handful of shut-ins who will be there. I don't know. Um, what does organic mean to you? Tweeners, what does Twitterers? Accepted by the government as not having had pesticides and sorts of things on it. She says it's approved by the government as not having pesticides and other things grown with it. Do you agree with that? You're shaking your head no. Come on, speak up. Okay. Any other opinions? There's a rule, like, it has to be so many years without, it's like five years or something without it being grown with humans. Okay. She says there's a rule, it has to be so many years without it being grown with, what, chemicals? Without Before it can be organic. Okay. These are all examples of sound bites that you've all heard. Um, none of you are correct, but <laughs> you heard these sound bites out in, in the ether, and, and but why do you think Americans buy organic? What are they looking for? Pardon? That's an excellent answer. She says status. That's exactly why people buy organic. It's a lifestyle choice. It's to separate me from someone else. But on a survey, why would someone say they buy organic? What? Because it's healthier. What else? Help the environment. What else? Safer? I'm not going to get sick? Safety is the number one answer Americans give. Okay? Organic is a production standard. There are rules that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has developed. You have to be three years without synthetic chemicals. But you are correct because what's a chemical? Well, nature's full of chemicals. So the difference is we do, in organic, they do not use synthetic chemicals. Basically, they're saying chemistry is a wonderful science, but we're going to ignore that. And just you know, anything that is produce, produced by nature, even if it's far more toxic than the synthetic version, that's OK to use because it's natural. Does organic have anything to do with food safety? Nothing. 
It is a production standard period, yet most people buy it because they think it's safer. It has nothing to do with microbial food safety, and we wrote a paper on this four years ago. And by the way, when it comes to determining who's right, who's wrong, how you find out about information, how do you do that? Do you go to Wiki? <laughs> You're shaking your head no, but I bet you do to start. <laughs> how do you know if someone's right or wrong? I can tell you a personal example. My father visited a month ago, and we had this sort of all-out family brawl over health care in Canada. <laughs> because my father insisted, like a good Canadian, that Canada has the best health care system in the world. And I said, well, it's, it's different here, because I've lived in Canada, and I've lived in the US. And I said, it's different. There's a whole bunch of issues around insurance. It depends how you measure it. It's just, it's different. Oh, no, he said it was a fact. Canada has the best health care system. I said, well, I don't actually agree with that. And we went back for it. You know, he was like, he saw the Michael Moore film, so he was convinced it was true. And I said, no, let's look on the Internet. So we went and looked on the Internet, and we went to the World Health Organization. And they actually stopped comparing countries seven years ago because there's too many different factors. How do you measure what's best? And the last time they did it, number one was France. Canada was 30th, and the U.S. was 37th. <laughs> what you have to look for is where is the preponderance of scientific evidence, evidence that's published in peer-reviewed journals, not by Whole Foods on their blog, where they claim all sorts of ridiculous things. All right? Instead, what we should be marketing is food safety. And companies are actually starting to do this. And I've been preaching about this for about three years, ever since spinach, when I said, you know, I think maybe parents would be interested in E. coli free spinach. They're now starting to do it. Uh, there's a company in Canada called Maple Lodge, and they're going to start marketing that they have this new antimicrobial treatment on their deli meats, and they're going to put it on the package. Like a little sticker, you know, like Sham Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to see that at the grocery store instead of all this other nonsense. And for 15 years, people have been blaming consumers. And by the way, this is a talk that I gave to vice presidents of, of major food corporations in Florida three weeks ago. I'm telling the same thing to you. I also gave the talk to the VP of food safety at Walmart, who's a friend of mine, and 40 of his staff. This stuff ain't rocket surgery. It's straightforward. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> don't go out and say you have the safest food in the world, because you don't. And stop blaming consumers, which is, I think, what you were getting at. Like, people choose to eat that stuff. What are consumers supposed to do about salmonella and peanut butter? Cook it? Don't eat peanut butter. Okay, well, you know, peanut butter is an inexpensive, high-quality protein. What about pot pies? You know, those 50-cent pot pies, which sickened 400 a couple of years ago. Are you, are, should people just not eat those? I mean, who are we to say what people should eat or not eat? But, I mean, geez, shouldn't it be safe? How did we get here? Letting the days go by, letting the water hold me down. <laughs> it's a talking head song. It's probably before all your time, but some of you may have heard it on the classic rock station or something. That's how we got here. People not paying attention. And I've talked to some veterans in the field and in the last few weeks, because I've been, I've been grappling with this question. How is it that we're having so many outbreaks today, much more than ever before? yet we're supposed to be so much more knowledgeable about food safety. Why is this happening? A lot of good people have been lost, relying on paperwork instead of people. Do you have any, anything to add, Phoebus? You know? We do recognize it a lot more, but 
you know, deliberately selling con salmonella contaminated peanut product is more than recognition. That's just outright negligence. And the, the culture that we live in that allows that is alarming. And that no one caught it. None of the state inspectors caught it. None of the inspectors from AIB caught it. They all just winked and let it go. So I think to address this, you know, we, you hear, well, we need more inspectors or we need a single food safety agency. I did an hour-long phone uh, radio thing in Baltimore on Monday. And everyone was, you need more inspectors. And I'm, no, you don't. Can you have enough inspectors to make sure that every employee actually washes their hands when they go to the bathroom? Can you inspect your way to a safe food supply? Inspectors have a role. They're there to verify. But don't expect too much from them. So we talk about food safety culture. And uh, my friend Frank, who's the VP of food safety at Walmart, actually wrote a book called Food Safety Culture, which is the first attempt to bring these things together. It basically says, how do you get everyone on your staff, whether you're in a restaurant or a grocery store or a farm or a processing outfit, to take these things seriously, to wash their hands? to not cross-contaminate, to do all the food safety basics that we know about that I can sit here in class and lecture you about, but will you actually do it in your kitchen? Probably not. What is safe food? I've already given you the answer. It's food that doesn't make you barf. <coughs> Whether it's you or your pet. You can ask Dr. Phoebus about his experiments on salmonella and pet food. <laughs> we even have a YouTube video where we try to be TV stars and talk to folks about pet food. But think about it. In all these things, you just got to be the bug. Think about where the bugs go. From your hands to the pet food. I got a four month old. She's going to start crawling in about a week. She's getting really close. Where's the first place she's going to head when she starts crawling? The dog food bowl on the floor, <laughs> which is loaded with what? All the germs from the roadkill my dog ate while we were out at the trail that has now been transmitted back into the bowl of dog food and has had a nice growth environment now that it's 80 degrees outside. Bugs move around. Every time, every year there's a pet food recall for salmonella, and every time there's a bunch of people get sick, and a lot of them are little kids. And it's not that parents are feeding their little kids pet food. <laughs> well, the older people are eating pet food. <laughs> it's that this cross-contamination occurs. All right, so one in four. Most of us can ride it out, like my PhD student here, and they just vomit. He's actually defending next week. Unbelievable. <laughs> I said I'd stop using this slide once he defended his PhD. It's been like five years. <laughs> but not all of us ride it out. Uh, this is the case of a five-year-old who was part of an E. coli 0157 H7 outbreak in Wales in 2005, in which 161 school kids got sick from the roast beef sandwiches they were served at lunch. And this kid died. And his mom said, I never knew it could kill you. And we see that every week in the US, in Canada, in Europe. People, I just didn't know. It isn't just barfing. It's very serious. And if the, uh, a professor from uh, over there, Pennington, just released a report on this outbreak. And uh, it's, it's pretty sobering reading for anyone who's advocating single food inspection agencies or more inspections. 
basically this guy was a butcher for, they called them butchers over there but you know basically it was a meat place that was taking raw product turning it into deli meats and stuff so this guy was a butcher for over 30 years full HACCP shop had been on all the training they had almost as many inspectors as they had employees and he had two machines to vacuum pack product one for raw product and one for cooked product and when one of those machines broke he decided not to spend the extra eight hundred dollars and started using the same machine for raw and cooked product none of the inspectors caught it they let it slide no one thought anything of it no one thought anything would get sick that's how people get sick is dumb little things which in retrospect you go oh well I never would have done that that place did not have a culture of food safety and that none of the employees none of the managers none of the inspectors thought to say hey dumbass maybe it's not a good idea to use the same machine on raw and cooked product and the worst part is the professor who did this inquiry did the same thing ten years earlier because in 1996 there was an outbreak of E. coli 0157 in Scotland which remains to date the largest kill rate because 22 people died elderly people from roast beef sandwiches and about 400 got sick why because the butcher in this case who was the butcher of the year in Scotland the year before Mr. Butcher of the Year did not know to use different knives for raw and cooked product. He used the same knives. It's not as glamorous as mad cow disease or something exotic, but this cross-contamination stuff, that's what makes people sick. That's what kills little five-year-olds like this. The World Health Organization has identified five factors that contribute to the bulk of foodborne illness, to those two billion people that get sick each year. Improper cooking, temperature abuse, lack of hygiene, that's hand washing, cross-contamination, and most importantly, and which none of the so-called consumer food safety education programs in the U.S. acknowledge, food from unsafe sources. You can temperature abuse all these things. That doesn't do much for fresh produce like spinach or lettuce or tomatoes. You've got to prevent that on the farm. So let's go through some of these factors. Where's that? Okay. How many of you have washed your hands in the union? What's wrong with this machine? Pardon? Okay, you don't wash your hands for 30 seconds. What? Blow dryer, what's wrong with the blow dryer? I've always been told to use paper towels. Okay, what else? It's hard to figure out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I mean, everyone tells you that food safety is simple, right? It's easy. Just wash your hands. Well, let's break it down. What is the proper way to wash your hands? You've seen the posters on the bathrooms all over campus, right? Dude, wash your hands. You've all read them religiously, no? Yeah? We made those. What's the proper way to wash your hands? Someone said 30 seconds. Can you imagine working in a restaurant in the back kitchen, and every time you were supposed to wash your hands, you had to stop for 30 seconds and do it? How long do you think you'd stay employed? Not long. And it's okay to be confused because I'm confused. The recommendations are all over the place. CDC says 15 seconds. FDA says 20 seconds. If you look in the literature, the best advice we can find is 10 seconds. Anything after that is not really worth it. Eight to ten seconds is sort of the minimum. And it's not even time that's important. What's important is the velocity of the water. It has to come out vigorously, very fast. And the friction of the water hitting your hands takes bugs off. Have you stuck your hands under these things? There's no friction from that water. 
What about soap? Soap's important. Usually when you stick your hands in, it's sort of hit and miss whether you're going to get any soap. It misses. Does water temperature count? Why? Pardon? She says hot water kills germs better. Is water temperature important? And by the way, every restaurant in the U.S. is inspected on whether they have warm water or not. The answer is no, it doesn't matter. For the water to be hot enough to actually kill bugs, you would peel their skin off. It's okay. But most people prefer warm water, so it's a comfort thing. And we want to encourage hand washing. And by the way, restaurants should have hot water for washing dishes. That's the important part. It's not hand washing. Okay, so it's water flow, it's soap. You rub vigorously with the soap for 10 seconds, and then you dry. And what do you dry with? Why do you dry with paper towel? What? You're all talking at the same time, and none of you loud enough. So you can throw it away? That's a good idea. Because you ever watch the chefs on TV? They have their you know, aprons on, and they always constantly recontaminate their hands on the same apron. So yeah, that's part of it, the disposability. And the other thing is the friction of wiping with paper towel as opposed to putting in a blow dryer, which disperses microorganisms into the environment. I don't know. Uh, with these things, you would think, I, I hypothesized that it's enclosed, so at least it's not putting in the environment. But I actually wrote the manufacturer and said, since you're pushing these things, it's up to you to do the research to demonstrate what's going on with these bugs and how people use them. Because what I observed when I came here in 2005 was that people looked at these things, they never got their hands dry and they'd have to wipe their hands and their pants. And then the next time they just wouldn't use it at all because they didn't want wet pants. <laughs> so I wrote the company and the company wrote back and said, we have done this study with 10 people in the UK. And I said, that's not very good. <laughs> oh, wow. Dr. Phoebus asked, what are my comments on manicures and jewelry? I presume you're talking about in a food service setting? Or even at home. Or even at home. You know, when you're, hand, when you're washing at home, you're just going to make yourself sick and maybe your, your kids or your partner and you probably got each other's germs anyway from all the gross things you do with each other. Um, <laughs> so it's not a big deal. It is a big deal when you go to your food service job. How many of you work in food service? Come on. How many have? Yeah. And you're making salads for a thousand people. Then it sort of counts. I actually got called in, in a, by a food service company to do uh, as an expert witness in a union litigation by a woman who wanted to wear her, her nose pierce, piercings. And she worked in food service. And got to look at the whole issue of nails and rings and what we came up with is that, you know, wedding rings are nice, but microorganisms do accumulate under there. So if you're doing food service, it's not the best idea to be wearing it because you, you don't wash very thoroughly under there. Nails are a huge problem. If you talk to people who, you know, grocery stores, you know how bread's out in those bins? What's the number one thing that they find in those bins when the bread's gone? False fingernails that have fallen off. And you're going, yuck, yeah, well, but, you know, beauty's a bitch, right? <laughs> So maybe you shouldn't have everyone on the street sticking their hands into these communal bread baskets. Not a good idea. Um, jewelry, like nose piercings, that presents a physical risk because it can fall out and it create, create a barrier where microorganisms can grow. Uh, that's basically what I advised the company and they won. And she had to take her jewelry out. What would you say?
and all these things be the bug. Think about being a bacteria, right? Where am I going to grow? Pardon? In a, clean place. In a clean place? With moisture and high temperature? Those are the sorts of things. People always ask me, and we'll get into this next lecture, but you know, what foods don't you eat? I don't eat raw sprouts. You like your raw sprouts? Alfalfa sprouts, broccoli sprouts. Think about how they're grown. High temperature, high moisture. It's an ideal incubator for even a single salmonella to proliferate. And they do, and the last outbreak was a couple weeks ago. All right, so what do these bathrooms have now? You haven't been here long. Paper towels. They didn't have paper towels before. That's how I got my job here, was because I commented on bathrooms. We have a whole website devoted to bathrooms from around the world. We're food safety nerds. <laughs> and by the way, I will mention, you know, any of you can email me. I'm always looking for new students to help out on this work. We do a lot of field research, like I have this project I want to do where basically I need a student to go eat 100 hamburgers. Tough job, eh? And I'm Canadian, so I say, eh? <laughs> but when you go to, not McDonald's, but to, you know, uh, Labco or some mom and pop joint, and they ask you, how do you want your burger? I want the student to be able to say, well, what do you mean? What does medium mean? Because the answer to me is, I want it to be 160 degrees. Because that's the only way to tell. I'll use those next lecture. So, I'm always looking for people. We'll wrap up with this. Um, you, all, you all know what HACCP is, right? Have a cup of coffee and pray. <laughs> Food safety system. <Yeah. laughs> That's what the inspectors call it. <laughs> HACCP is this food safety system, but it's not a very good one because it's very rigid and it doesn't get into human behavior. And food safety culture is all about human behavior. Now this is an example. This is a cheese shop in eastern Ontario, on Lake Ontario, touristy area. The cheese manufacturing plant that has a retail market out front. And on the door it says we're HACCP. And I go in like, what's that mean? He says, I don't know, but it looks cool on the door. It's HACCP. But it also says the public bathroom is out of order. There's a Johnny on the spot out back. Now remember, this is a HACCP place. Just like that butcher in Wales was a HACCP place. And there's the Johnny on the spot. And we sat and we watched people walk out back and go to the Johnny on the spot. Is there any hand washing facilities? No. What do cheese shops have? No. <laughs> they have cheese. <laughs> they have cheese samples. <laughs> And we would watch people going out back, doing their business, and then sticking their microbiologically laden hands into piles of cheese curds. That's how people get sick. And by the way, that's one of my daughters in the background. And she's looking disgusted, not because of the microbiologically laden hands, but because we're on vacation and I'm still talking about food safety and taking pictures. <laughs> I'll leave you with this. If you think the employees must wash hands is keeping the piss out of your Happy Meals, it's not. 